Basketball was invented in 1891 by Dr. James Naismith. He invented it at the Springfield College, Massachusetts. The college was the international YMCA training school and the game was invented to provide an indoor activity for trainee YMCA leaders. When the game was first played, pitch baskets were nailed up at each end of the gymnasium as goals, hence the origin of the name basketball. The Converse Chuck Taylor All-Stars, produced in 1917, were originally a shoe that came in brown colors with black trim. In the 1920s, Converse All-Stars were made in all black canvas or leather versions. The All-Star was to be the first mass-produced basketball shoe in North America. It consisted of a very thick rubber sole and an ankle cover in canvas or sometimes leather upper. The PF Flyers Bob Cousy All-American were another basketball shoe very similar to Converse. In fact, they were purchased by Converse on the following years after their launch. These shoes, as well as the Converse, were very uncomfortable. However, for the players of those times, they were very innovative and it was a, whole, a huge improvement compared to the uh, lifestyle or their current day shoes that they wore. The Adidas Superstar, introduced in 1971, was a low-top shoe with a, with a leather upper and together with a hard rubber outsole and it was used by many of the all-time great centers like Karim Abdul-Jabbar. The Nike Bruin is one of Nike's first low-top basketball sneakers. It was very simple featuring a plain upper with the trademark Nike swoosh on the side. This showed off the brand with pride. It was first released in 1972 and featured a classic herringbone design outsole for added traction. This was one of the first implementations of the a dedicated traction pattern on a basketball shoe. The simple Nike Bruin was released in a variety of colorways using either swood or leather for the upper. The Puma Clyde in 1973 was used and named after the New York Knicks star Cl uh, Walt Clyde Fraser. This shoe was a low top leather upper and hard rubber outsole which outperformed most of the Adidas superstars that were available on the market. The Converse Pro Leather were the preferred shoe of Julius Irving after they came out in 1976. He liked this shoe more than the previously sold Chuck Taylor All-Star by the same company since it had improved the, the injury protection of the shoe and its technology. It had improved the impact protection, however, it was still lacking of some shock absorption. How, um, but the main point of the main selling point of these shoes was that they had changed the then flexible uh, canvas upper to a now a more resistant and improved leather upper. The Nike Blazer introduced to the market in 1978 had become a very popular shoe in America. People liked this shoe more than the previously sold Nike Bruin since this shoe offered a high top upper which was more impact protecting and offered better ankle stability than the low top which was offered in the Nike Bruin. This shoe was the predecessor of the worldwide known Air Jordan 1 since it presented a similar silhouette. Designed by Bruce Kilgore and introduced in 1992, the Air Force One was the first ever basketball shoe to feature Nike Air technology, revolutionizing the game and sneaker culture forever. Over three decades since its first release, the Air Force One remains true to its roots while earning its status as a fashion staple for the seasons to come. In 1992, the legend of Nike Air... <laughs> The Air Jordan 1, introduced in 1985, was a shoe that had a great traction, however on the other hand, the cushioning wasn't great. The materials were very high quality by presenting a full leather uppers and rubber midsole and outsole, 
which added sturdiness as well as weight. They aren't heavy, but it's something you will notice while transitioning. The Converse weapons introduced in 1986 were a shoe that Larry Bird and Magic Johnson wore during the mid-80s. The weapon bears an upper fully constructed out of smooth leather overlays with very simple and, and vivid color blocking style. A vulcanized white midsole on every colorway is set off by the corresponding accented outsole that sits on top of it. The Nike Air Jordan 3 was introduced in 1998. On the other hand, to the Air Jordan 1, this shoe presented a low top leather upper with a polyurethane midsole. These midsoles were very rigid and didn't act as very impact protecting. The next sports Ewings 33 High were a shoe designed for the centers. This shoe offered a high top very, resi very resistant upper together with a very heavy outsole and midsole. They were introduced in 1999. The Reebok pumps or Omni lights presented in 1991 offered a mid top because it was not neither high or low top and that consisted mainly of leather a leather upper together with a very heavy outsole and midsole. Just like the rest of the shoes during the 90s, the materials were ver weren't very shock absorbent or impact protecting. The Nike Force introduced in 1994 were a shoe designed towards centers as they were very heavy but offered a very great traction and an improved impact protection with the air bubble in the heel. This shoe was made out of very resistant materials. The Nike Air Swoops in introduced in 1995 were the second shoe from Nike Basketball named after a famous athlete. In this case, it was after a woman, Cheryl Swoops. The Nike Air Jordan 11 introduced in 1995 was a high top basketball shoe that offered great traction and solid cushioning with a lightweight phylon and full length L unit in place in the midsole. The Nike Air Max Penny Orlando, introduced in 1995 and named after Penny Hardaway, were a shoe that offered also a very good traction as it was very durable and resistant and it had an also an adequate cushioning just like the Jordan 11 with an air bubble at the bottom of the heel. The rebook The Question introduced in 1996 were named after Allen Iverson, which his nickname was The Answer. These shoes were very resistant and durable, however they were very heavy. These shoes offered a great traction and a high top leather upper. The Adidas KB8 named after Kobe when he was playing for the Lakers and he was using Adidas offered an air mesh lining, an inner booty construction, EVA midsole and torsion system plate. Keyshox BB4 was the first shoe in implement the Nike Shox cushioning. This was a spring-like cushioning that compressed when the player impacted the ground after a jump. It was introduced in the year 2000 and the shoe offered a very great um, impact protection as well as durability and traction on its, out on its outsole. The Nike Air Zoom Generation or, the, or LeBron's first signature shoe was introduced in, two thousand, in 2003. This shoe was very similar to the Jordan 3 in the sense that both were um, low tops which offered a leather upper and great traction. In the case of LeBron, the, the, LeBron, the LeBron ones offered a better impact protection by using the air bubble on the heel. 
The Adidas Adizero or Adizero Crazy Light were introduced in the year 2010. They claim to be the lighter shoe produced in NBA history. They weighed nearly 280 grams and they had great impact protection. They were very comfortable and offered great stability. The Nike Kobe 5, also introduced in the year 2010, regardless of being a low top shoe, it offered great support, great fit, materials, cushioning, traction, and it was a great outdoor shoe. It offered very durable and resistant materials. The Leaning Way of Weight, introduced in 2012, was one of the first Chinese brands to introduce a shoe in the NBA. The star of their shoe was the shooting guard Dwayne Wade. This shoe offered a low top leather upper together with a great traction and midsole. The Nike LeBron 10, introduced in 2013, was a shoe that offered great impact protection thanks to its high top upper together with the full length air unit on the midsole. However, this full length air unit made very easy to roll the ankle, which made the support not be as good. The Under Armour Curry one was the first shoe from the Curry line. This shoe was introduced to the league in 2015 and it had a revolutionary amortization system which consisted of the charge system, which was an, a more efficient evolution to the micro G cushioning. The Nike Adapt DB, introduced in 2018, offered a new and never seen before lacing system to the Nike line. This shoe had a robotized um, laces which were controlled with your phone instead of making the player lace them up before each game. In the Thumb Freak 2, there is some significant tech present in the shoe, like a multi-material upper, internal heel counter, internal shank, TPU 4 foot clips, and a 4 foot thumb unit. Overall, for materials and aesthetics, I would give the Thumb Freak 2 an 8.5 out of 10. The materials on the Thumb Freak 2 are still mostly textiles and synthetics, however, from a field standpoint, the Thumb Freak 2 does seem more premium compared to the Thumb Freak 1s, mainly due to the mesh used. In terms of looks, though, I would prefer the Thumb Freak 1s more as the Thumb Freak 2s do look like running shoes. For me, they are definitely more for on the court than off the court. One weird thing I noticed is that the heel portion of the mill sole looks a bit familiar. It kind of reminds me of the Nike PG1. Maybe they reduced the tolling. I guess we'll never know, as well as the function of it. In the NBA, not many players have been wearing this as compared to the Thumb Freak ones. Currently, the most notable players who rocks this are the Antetokounmpo brothers. Um, they are Giannis Antanasis in the Milwaukee Bucks and Costas in the Los Angeles Lakers. The fact that no more players have been wearing this might be to a concern of the performance. Fit-wise, I would give the Thumb Freak 2 a 9 out of 10. It is still a pretty snug shoe, but not as much as the Thumb Freak ones. Which, with snug, I mean that it fits better narrow foot. This is really surprising because from a visual standpoint, the Freak 2s do look a little sleeker compared to last year's model. That said, the shoe does fit true to size. Therefore, you won't need to go, to go up half a size or down half a size. And white footers don't really need to worry with this as the lacing systems seem quite forgiving. The lockdown on the shoe was really great on the Nike Thumb Freak 2, much like last year's Thumb Freak 1s. On the top of the sleek shoe structure, the lacing system has a panel on the medial side that made the shoe feel really secure from midfoot forward. At the heel, the internal heel counter and the midsole structure keeps the foot in place. 
Overall, for support, I would give it a 9 out of 10. There is a mistake people make while associating the foot support with high cut shoes and associating uh, injuries to low cut shoes as they think that it is easier to roll your ankle in them. Truth is that this is really not the case. Usually, the high cut portion of the shoe is made mostly of textiles, knit, upper, as well as foam padding. This bit of materials do not stop you from rolling your ankles, it's just not strong enough. The Nike Thumb Freak 2 is just the perfect example. The Thumb Freak 2 is considered a lower cut basketball shoe, but just the way the shoe is sculpted with the midsole dropping up the sides of the shoe, the snugness of the feet and the course of the TPU forefoot clips, your feet do not go anywhere. To add on that, there is also a relatively stable base and even though the outsole is decoupled, the heel to toe transition seems seamless. Continuing with the cushioning, I would give it a 9 out of 10 as well. Now the double stack heel thumb unit is gone and the Nike Thumb Freak 2 brings us back uh, to a more traditional setup which is the 4 foot thumb unit. This simple but effective setup worked better than the Thumb Freak 1 had. It's a wonder why they put the double stacked heel Thumb unit in the first place. Maybe it is done so that the Thumb Freak 2 can have an improvement from the Thumb Freak 1. So this is a marketing technique that will uh, raise their sales. Then the responsiveness and bounce back from the 4 foot Thumb unit is great as usual and feels much better than just foam previously. In the heel, there is no tech except from the foam itself and the impact protection could be a little better. One thing to note is that the midsole does seem to crease very easily and have heard from people that the rubber in the midsole might be a little too soft when broken in. But so far, I do not have that issue. Um, the traction overall it's really impressive and it has a 9.5 out of 10. The traction is where things get interesting. The Nike Thumb Freak 2 features knobs that are placed in a radial arrangement at the forefoot and the heel is filled with thick lines with the names of Janice's brothers. For most hoopers you will know that the traction at the heel doesn't, doesn't usually do much so a lot of the focus is at the forefoot. And for the forefoot and for the forefoot the grip on the ground is amazing. As usually, when the knobs are used, there isn't going to be a dust trap within the groove, so slippage is minimized extremely. Dust does, does stick to the outsole over time, but so far, it does not seem to affect the grip. As a bonus, the rubber used in the Freak 2 is one, of the, is one on the thicker side, so it will probably last a bit outdoors compared to common indoor models and even with the knobs. You know that the forefoot is going to get burned out first because the knobs are very easily break broken. But with this thick rubble, I don't think that this is going to happen. The, <laughs> the arrangement of the knob, which is circular in the traction pattern, is designed so that Giannis Antetokounmpo can spin, and which is one of his sing uh, signature moves and one of the, his most effective ones, Easily through the defense, as the circular traction pattern won't be intrusive in the movement. Overall, the shoe, I would give it a 9 out of 10 in all of the categories. As of my final conclusion, I think that the Thumb Freak 2 was really fun to play in. It. It's the kind of shoe that is simple, can't fit to any playstyle, and is above an average and is an above average performer. Sure. I would love to see more tech being put into the shoe and we know that it will come as we progress further into the Nike Zoom Freak line. It may be just the beginning, but I think Janis is in good hands with Nike. The technology in basketball shoes have, has been evolving through the years. I would like to highlight a number of general aspects that have been improving in the shoes for decades. In terms of weight, it went from solid or compact polymeric materials to combining porous or expanding materials with compact ones. Obviously, these changes improve the lightness of the footwear and if you compete with less weight, 
you will achieve greater height when jumping. The part of the sole that will be in contact with the ground must be solid for good durability, while the upper part can contain porous materials. In the porous ones, we can distinguish those with closed pores, they have a kind of outer skin, from those with open pores, such as, for example, the well-known EVA, which is ethyl vinyl acetate, com polymer. Polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, has been a widely used material because it is economical both in its material and in its processing, as well as being able to obtain both compact and expanded, normally closed pore, and as a thermos and, and as a thermoplastic material, it can be recycled. Surely, its main disadvantages are its high base density, it does not have an excellent grip as it's a bit slippery, and it is not as elastic as it would be desirable. A good material for the soles is rubber. One of its variants, thermoplastic rubber, which improves those disadvantages that PVC presents, but I would consider that vulcanized rubber or rubber is even better since the elastomer is very light, has very good values of adhesion, elongation, at break, and tear resistance. Its main drawbacks are the cost for both the material and process of, of obtaining the shoe. The high tear resistance allows them to be sewn. It is also a material that resists many flexing cycles without cracking the sole. These rubber soles attached to leather cuts with vulcanized and sewn adhesives with structural reinforcement to avoid sprains and foam synthetic linings are a great combination to obtain for high, for high quality shoes. Overall, I can choose one part as the most important one from a shoe, but I consider various very important. For example, the combinations of materials and design of the base are, are key for the production of an excellent sport shoe. For example, rubber has a very good value for the coefficient of friction, which is the grip and how good the traction will be, but the pattern it has also has, also has its influence, like car tires. This means that the for a for a for friction to be good in a in a shoe, not only it depends on the type of material used, but also on the pattern. In the case of basketball shoes, the one that has internal reinforcements on the sides to the, to prevent it from bending laterally at the ankle area is really important to avoid sprains. So this is another aspect which is very important in injury prevention. In terms of cushioning, I think a soft cushioning causes less stress on the joints. Although, on the other hand, there are a series of movements that must be restricted so it should have a more rigid damping in the lateral direction. I will put an example to try it to clarify it. A soft sole makes the ankles and knees less punishing when falling to the ground after performing a jump. However, in a lateral stress, the sole could be deformed to a greater extent which co could cause an ankle sprain. As often happens in a balance it's, it's virtue, a compromise solution must be found between these extremes. In addition, there are solutions such as using soft materials in which rigid reinforcements are inserted that minimize some, some torsion or deformation in general of the sole while maintaining high impact absorption. In terms of the properties I look for, I consider a number, a number of properties that are highly relevant to the performance of a sports shoe and are determined by both the materials and the design. Although it must be said that they are usually combined in the components that make up the footwear and how these parts are assembled. Among the properties of materials can be highlighted. For the soles, density, hardness, resistance to abrasion, elasticity, plasticity, which is the elongation at break and tensile strength, the resistance to tearing, resistance to growth of incisions, which are cracks, and other, but I think that these are the priority. For cutting, um, I think abrasion resistance, tearing resistance, abrasion resistance thread breaking breakage in seams, waterproofing, and perspiration. For the shoe, 
addition values between the upper and between the upper sole and resistance to bending fatigue due to incision growth. There are also tests for other components such as buffers, buttresses, laces, textile, textile materials. These properties can be quantified or qualitatively assessed in certain cases. By performing a standardized test, the UNE, a Spanish standard regulation of AENOR, a Spanish Association for Standardization, allows these values to be quantified by carrying out the corresponding tests. The Technological Institute of Footwear in ESCOP, which has the headquarters of Elche and Elda in our province, has the necessary laboratory equipment to carry out these, type, these types of tests.